expectations about that. So they're saying that what really needs to happen is parents and other caregivers need to direct more speech towards <coughs> children between the ages of one and three before they hit preschool, before they're hitting you know, pre-K or kindergarten, and that if parents don't, and it, this is not to say that low SES parents don't want to do this, low SES parents don't have the time to do this because what are they doing? Working. Working, right? They have children, their children are in care, their children are in care in a room with 10 or 15 other kids. The speech is not directed at the children, the children are not interacting, and, and although this is a reality of the modern world, this is perpetuating inequity because those children who are not getting a chance to interact linguistically with another person all day long are actually getting fewer words, less input, and it's contributing to their cognitive development in a way that may have long-term consequences. So if you ever thought it was important to go to school and get your degree, and I mean, we have what, 30, 40% of students at Georgia State who are first time college students in their family, this is a huge difference. It means that your children and your children's children, because of the choices that you're making right now, will potentially have more opportunities, not just economically, but cognitively. They're gonna have, because of the time you will be able to spend with them, right? The time you can spend with them. The, the things that you can offer them in terms of interaction, the things that, you can, that you'll be able to offer your grandchildren in terms of interaction, will make long-term differences. And that's kind of huge if you think about it, because we think, oh, you know, they're just babies. It doesn't matter. But it really does matter because the human brain is designed to process language and language is the fundamental structure of human cognitive development. I really believe that. And it makes a big difference. When we spend time talking with our babies, we make a difference in their future. So talk to the baby, because he's super adorable. Talk to him in lots of languages, it's a good thing. Totally do. Totally do. <laughs> That's a good thing. Okay, so now we've gotten to a place where babies are talking. They are now in between 12 and 18 months. They are starting to produce single word utterances that we call holophrases. Holophrases are entire statements made in a single word. So this is where the baby says, mommy. And that means, where's my mom? Or, mommy, which means, mom, you're not doing what I want. Or, mommy, mommy's home. I'm so excited about that. Okay, so single words with intonation are used to express whole ideas. And people who are used to being around the child are able to interpret their words and interpretation uh, pretty effectively to interact with the child. Now at this stage, children aren't just using words that are familiar to most speakers of the language that the child is acquiring, but they're also using what we call idiomorphs. Idiomorphs are words that are peculiar to the child. So these are words that the child and his or her caregivers have decided work in their environment. So for example, my daughter, who is now 14, still refers to mango juice, which is one, one of her favorite things when she was a baby. She loved mango juice, she still loves mango juice. She still calls it baba. Because if she wanted it in her bottle when she was a baby, she wanted it in a cup when she was drinking from a cup, and just as a joke, we still to this day, she will say, Baba, Mom, you got Baba, that's so great. Baba is an idiomorph, because Baba has nothing to do with the word mango juice. Absolutely nothing at all. Um, but that was her word for it when she was a baby, that was her idiomorph. 
So these are words that the, the family decides are the names for things. So special animals, the special blanket, you know, maybe a particular person. Uh, my, uh, my daughter's little sister, uh, her, who's the, the daughter of my ex-husband, he referred, she referred to Maggie as Mimi, because she couldn't say Maggie, that's my daughter's name. And so she would just call her Mimi, Mimi, Mimi. So she still calls her Mimi, even though nobody in the world calls her Mimi. That's an idiom word for her big sister. Okay, so these are words that no one else would necessarily recognize, but people in the child's close, close community recognize as labels for things. What did you say? Single word for an entire audio word? A holophrase. Okay. So that's why this is called the holophrastic stage, because this is the stage where children are using a single word to refer to whole ideas or concepts. Um, now, when children are in this stage, it makes sense, right? If we think about caregiver speech, caregiver speech is very focused on concrete objects. It's very focused on directives and questions, you know, having to do with things that are immediately in the child's environment, things that are important to the child right now, foods that the child likes, people that the child cares for, objects that the child finds comfort in, places that the child likes to go. <coughs> so, those personally relevant people and objects are the things the child wants to name first and wants to talk about first because those are the things that the child takes immediate reward from. These, just the words that the child uses are often phonologically simplified. So the child is still developing the ability to articulate with the hundreds of muscles that are necessary to coordinate adult like speech. And so the child simplifies the words to make them easier to say. And in fact, the way that the child simplifies them is quite predictable. We're going to talk about that in a minute. At this time, the child can go from having no words for things to very quickly having about a hundred or more different words for things to talk about. And if you can imagine going from nothing to a hundred words, you can do a lot with a hundred words, especially for things in your immediate environment that have to do with your food, your care, and people you care about. So the child has now become truly communicative, truly linguistic, interacting, using words, labeling things in ways that other people understand, and people who spend some time with the child can understand. At this point, we also see the child starting to develop semantic categories. And we've talked about categorical perception for sounds, where different versions of, for example, p get accepted as the p sound, and different versions of b get accepted as the b sound. But there are also semantic categories. So for example, we have to learn that a Chihuahua and a Great Dane and a Bulldog all count as dogs, right? There's a lot of differences we have to ignore to recognize that those are all the same. That's an amazing ability of humans to ignore. I mean, think about the difference between a Chihuahua and a Great Dane, and we recognize that they both go in the same category as dog. That's kind of weird. And babies have to learn this. They have to learn that there are, that that ability to do categorical perception of sound needs to spread out and generalize to the ability to create semantic categories. Because for example, their house cat and a tiger have to go in the same category, right? Even though a house cat and a chihuahua probably look more alike, right? So what is it that they have to learn about what they should pay attention to and what they should ignore? Do you guys know the difference between a dog and a cat? The really fundamental difference between a dog and a cat? Retractable claws. That's it. That's the big difference. <laughs> Cats can retract their claws, dogs can't. Like, I didn't know that, but yet somehow I figured out that dogs and cats were different. That's, a, that's really the fundamental difference between the two of them. So at this point, children start to play with categories. They're trying to figure out what counts as an example of something or an exemplar of something, and what doesn't. And they start showing uh, 
cases of what we call overextension and underextension. So overextension is where they have made a category that takes in too many cases. So for example, anything that's furry, grandma's furry coat, or uh, a cow, or a dog, or a fluffy furry pillow, any of those things can be doggies. Okay, because they think that what what makes something a doggy is that it's furry. That's an overextension. Sometimes they also engage in what we call underextension, where they've made their category too restrictive. So they think that the family's breed of dog, for example, is what counts as a dog, and other things are something else. So and let me just give you an example. When my daughter was very small, uh, when she came home from the hospital, we had two English Bulldogs. So my daughter has grown up with English Bulldogs. And English Bulldogs are not typical dogs, okay? They have smushy faces, short ears, little curly tails, they're kind of fat, they're very short, okay? They look very different from, say, something like a Labrador or a Great Dane or a Chihuahua. They look really weird compared to other dogs. But she had grown up with these dogs and thought that this was totally normal. This is what a dog is supposed to look like. And she had a friend come over around this time. She had a friend come over who, at, at their home, they had a golden retriever. And that little girl had learned that golden retrievers were dogs. And she came over to our house and she saw our male English bulldog, who since passed away, but he was awesome. His name was Jazz. And she came in the door and she saw Jazz. And Jazz came kind of waddling up to her, his, you know, fat bulldog self. And he was snorting. <laughs> and he was very excited. And he was kind of hopping around. And she said, oh, It's a pig! It's a pig! She was so excited that Maggie had a pet pig. She's like, Do you have a pig! It's a pig! It's a pig! And she was looking at Jazz, and she said, look, it's got a smushy nose, it's fat, it's got a curly tail, and it snorts. It goes oink, oink. Listen to it. It's a pig, right? So that's an, a great example. She was overextending the category of pig, right, to include bulldogs. And she was underextending the category of dogs to include things that didn't have long floppy ears and a long tail and longer fur and long legs and were long and skinny. She just she did not get that Jazz and Lacey, our two bulldogs, were not pigs. She was super excited. She says, it's a farm. <laughs> that our house was a farm. Well, kind of it was. It felt, it felt like a farm. Right? But here we had these two English bulldogs, and she's like, they have pigs. She was super, super excited that we had pigs. So, um, and needless to say, Jazz and Lacey couldn't have cared less, but my daughter was incensed. She says, it's not a pig, it's a jazz. <laughs> it's jazz. She was so mad, she's like, it's not a pig, it's a dog. Like, how can you not know that that's a dog? She's like, it's a pig. They had this big argument about whether it's a pig or a dog. It was really kind of super helpful. And then it took about, you know, three minutes. And they were like, yeah, we forgot about that. Now, at this stage, children are engaging in phonological simplifications that, you guessed it, are rule governed, right? Kids don't do phonological simplifications arbitrarily. And in fact, you're going to see that children engage in very similar simplifications and changes as adults who are drunk <laughs> or not paying attention to what they're saying because simplifying speech is simplifying speech. So now we're gonna learn about a different domain of speech analysis, which involves analyzing children's speech. And children tend to follow some very straightforward rules when it comes to simplifying speech so they can get words out. Because what their big mission is, is to get words out because now they can talk 
and now it's really exciting, and now they can share information from their brains with your brains, and it's a big deal. And so they want to get their ideas out, but they can't articulate them in the same way that you do. They're just not skilled enough yet. It's hard to get all those muscles to do what you need them to do. Plus, it's work, and you know what? We're one, and we don't want to do work. We're used to not even having to wipe our own butts. So we kind of just want to make things as easy as possible. So here's some general principles that children use, very young children use, to simplify their speech. And we also see that some of these principles generalize to other speech. So when we see different dialects emerge for different languages, these principles also continue to apply because human beings want language to be easier to produce. That's just a general value. I want to be able to share my ideas with you, and I want it to be easier to do. The harder it is to do, the more pain in my butt it is, and I want it to be easy to do. So we see these, you might recognize that some of these differences are reflected in some dialects of English or other languages that you know. And that's totally normal because language is always moving towards a place of easier production, always. We want our language to be easier to produce, no matter what. So the first rule is stops are easy. Okay. I'm a little baby, like one, one and a half. Making my articulator stay just a tiny bit apart so I can make fricatives and things like that, that's hard. Slamming them together so that I can just keep the air from moving through, that's easy. So if I can turn something into a stop, I'm going to turn it into a stop, because stops are easy. I like stops. Liquids, things like l and r, those are hard. In fact, r, the r sound, is the very last sound that most American English-speaking children ever learn, because it's the hardest sound to make. L and r are hard. They involve very complex articulation. The tongue has to do some very fancy things. The jaw, everything has to do, everything has to be in just the right position. And in fact, the rough sound that we have in American English is an extremely rare sound. It's only found in very few languages of the world because most languages have decided it's too much to make that sound. And not even all dialects of American English have it which is why you can go to, for example, New York, and you can you know, go to the fourth floor, because that R on the end of four, a floor and in fourth is just too damn much work. So babies know this, and people in New York know this. We don't want to mess with the R. Okay? Front is better than back. Now, if you think about this, babies start off making lots of sounds in the back. But the truth is, where do they have the most nerve endings? Where do they have the most sensitivity? Not in the back of their throat. Up here, in their lips and in the tip of their tongue. They have a ton of sensitivity. And babies are hugely aware of what people talking to them are doing with the front of their mouth. When you talk to a baby, that baby can see what you're doing up here, what you're doing with your face, what you're doing with your lips, when your tongue comes out and when it doesn't. The baby cannot see what's happening back here. All that fancy stuff in your throat. The baby can't see that. But the baby can also can see what's happening up here in the front, and the baby can feel, has amazing feeling here. Uh, huge amounts of, huge numbers of nerve endings here in the lips, in the tip of the tongue. And so the baby has, gets a huge amount of feedback when he or she engages in movement of the lips and the tongue, which is why babies do this, they make all these, all these weird things, because they can feel that. And when they're back here going, they don't feel anything, right? You can do it, you don't feel anything either. Okay. So they like to make sounds that are more front than back. So you're going to see more bilabial sounds, more interdental sounds, more alveolar sounds than palatal uvular sounds, because they can see those front sounds happening. 
and they know that the people around them are making those sounds. Babies prefer similar over different. So remember, even early on, babies like babbling, right? The reduplicative babbling, where they're going ba 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 over ba bi da bu na bi na ba ba ba. Right. So they know they have to get to where they can do those shifts, but it's way easier just to send a phonological gestural score. Right, to send that code that says, do this same thing over, 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 right? Simple is better than difficult. Duh, right? And I'm a baby. I'm supposed to make everything easy. So if they have the option of making the consonants in a word all the same or making them more alike, they will totally do it. If they can make the vowels in a word more alike, they will totally do it. Like my daughter, when she's trying to say mango juice, and she says, baba, right? Because baba, ba is the first syllable in bottle, and that's what we were saying with bottle. So she would say baba. Two syllables, same first syllable, right? I've done the right number of syllables. I did the first word. You know what I mean? Give me my freaking mango juice. All right? I don't want to negotiate this. Just give me what I want. Okay. They also focus on stressed syllables over unstressed syllables because when adults stress things, that draws the child, child's attention to them. So in child-directed speech, they will say, what are you doing? What are you doing? Are you playing with the puppy? Isn't the puppy so cute? Okay, so what's getting emphasized are nouns, verbs, adjectives. And that child-directed speech teaches children what stressed matters. What's, it's what draws their attention. And so they learn that things that are stressed matter more and things that aren't stressed don't matter as much. And we still do that as adults, right? I mean, if I sit up here and just go, rah, 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 and then all of a sudden I go, and now, this thing, write it down. You write it down, right? Because you know, you're well trained, that stressed things matter more. Thank you for learning that. You've been doing it since you were a baby. <coughs> Okay, so let's take a look at some of the things that babies do. So babies engage in a number of very predictable processes. We call them phonological simplification. Things that they're doing to make saying the word easier. Phonological simplification. One process that babies use, which we've already seen in adults, is something called substitution. And in fact, you'll see this in adult speech too. When adults engage in substitution, it's not just freakish arbitrary substitution in many cases. Sometimes they are still following these same very predictable patterns that they produced when they were babies. The first uh, pattern of substitution that we observe is called fronting. And fronting is when a child takes a consonant and replaces it with something that's made more to the front of the mouth. So what changes is the place of articulation. The manner stays the same, the voicing stays the same, but the place of articulation moves forward in the mouth. So instead of saying talk, talk, like an adult might say, they say, I want to talk to you. Talk. Let's talk. Okay. So note that the k at the end of talk and the p at the end of top, the only difference in those two things is that p is made at the bilabial place of articulation and k is made at the velar place of articulation. And again, IPA comes back to haunt you. <laughs> I told you you were going to need to know this. It doesn't go away. We know that these things are psychologically real to people because even babies know that they're real. They even know the place of articulation, manner of articulation, and voice matter. We're going to see that today. So fronting is when you take a pronunciation that's typically made further back in the mouth and you just change the place to something made further forward in the mouth. Now if you take a look at your IPA chart, 
I don't want to lose you, John. You okay? Yeah. Okay, you're not going to fall asleep or anything. Nope. You're cold. Okay. You're just going to like fall asleep. All right. No, no, no. So on the, if you take a look at your IPA chart, you'll see that it starts over with bilabial and it moves over to the right all the way back to glottal. Okay. So the further left you are, that's more front. The further right you are, that's more back. So if you see that all that's changed is the sound has moved from the right of the chart to the left of the chart, then what's happening is fronting. Okay? If the voicing has stayed the same, if the manner has stayed the same, but all that's changed is the place. Precious, you got your chart out right now? All right. Superstar. All right. So let me show you this, just as a visual image. marvelous notation. Okay. okay, so if something moves from here, up here, we're talking fronting, okay? Everything to the left is more front than anything to the right. So that means bilabial is more front than labiodental, labiodental is more front than interdental, interdental is more front than alveolar, alveolar is more front than palatal, palatal, and so forth, okay? So it's fronting moving to the side of the chart. Thank you. Another phenomenon we see children engage in is something called gliding. <coughs> gliding happens when children take a glide, and you know where we have two glides, whoop and yup, and they use them to replace those nasty, nasty liquids because l and r are hard and what and yup are easier. So instead of saying lion, which is tough, they say lion. <laughs> Hawaiian. And I would ask my daughter, Maggie, what do lions say? She would say, Hawaiian says, wah. <laughs> right? The Hawaiian, where the wah has replaced with, the la has been replaced with wah, and the, says roar, right? Roar has an R and an R at the beginning and the end. She's like, forget that noise. <laughs> wah. All was. All W sounds. Okay? Hawaiian says wow. So Hawaiian says wow. That's what I learned. Yes. And when does the R sign into place? I mean, Aiden says it all the time, so that's why I'm, I don't know, I'm not really. So R's don't, um, R's typically come in last. Um, so uh, I would ask you, are, are, so are R's, the R's that we're talking about also common in Farsi? You have a. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You have them in Farsi too? Yeah. Okay. So your son is bilingual in Farsi and English, right? He understands it. He understands it, right. So that, that's what the important part. Because as long as he knows what you're talking about, he's hearing the sounds. So for him, I would actually expect him, how old is he now? Two? Two. So I would expect him to have er maybe even sooner yeah, than an American English. Than, yeah, he's had it for a while because he knows it's important for both languages. He needs it. It's really important. Now, my uh, daughter's little sister, who is eight now, has to, she's in speech therapy right now to try and get her R, because she's just, she does not have an American, she has a lisp. So it's, a, it's, she's still gliding, right? She still says, you know, we're going on the road, and it's driving her dad and mom crazy, because they really want her to say road. And they're like, she's eight, she should say road. And so he's actually in speech therapy to get this sound. So I would guess it's because he speaks, he's learning multiple languages that have that sound. So he knows it really matters. It's much more obvious to him. <coughs> so, <coughs> but if you're gonna have a lisp, right, when we talk about <coughs> lisps, lisps affect L's and R's, right? That's the, and people go into speech therapy because they can't get these sounds because they're, they're hard. And if they just don't acquire them and they manage to do this gliding thing for a long time and it kind of just works and everybody around them accepts it, they just don't get it, right? And they're kind of like, why do you care? Just get it. What's your problem? Because, you know, simplification. It's a good thing. And then there's stopping. This is when a fricative gets replaced with a stop. 
because fricatives involve holding the articulators just far enough apart to get frication, right, or friction. So you get or right, you either get that hissing sound or the buzzing sound. And that's hard, holding things just a little bit apart, right? Just like trying to hold, like if you ever tried to do a plank, and you gotta, yeah, right? And you're trying to just hold that plank, you're like, okay, now bend your elbows, bend your elbows, now just hold it right there with your elbows up, and you're like, I just wanna fall flat on the ground, right? Or I wanna lock my elbows and have them up like this, right? But holding it right there in the middle, and your arms are shaking, because holding your muscles in that position is a lot harder than either slamming them shut or locking them up, right? So holding everything wide open or all the way closed is a lot easier than holding them just a little tiny bit apart. And that's the same idea here. So this is why children will say things like think as tink. And you'll actually hear this in some dialects of English where the fricatives th and th have been replaced with t and d because it's a stopping. This is just easier to do. And the reality is that tink is just as good a word as think. And if everybody knows what you mean, then go for it, right? Because the whole point of speaking is to have other people understand you. So stopping is when you replace a fricative with a stop. Then there are cases of assimilation. Okay, assimilation is when, I've already told you that kids like to make things more similar. So assimilation, these are cases where uh, rather than just swapping out an articulatory feature, just straight up, what kids are doing is focusing on making things more the same. So they're taking an articulatory feature and trying to generalize it across a word. So for example, take the word beans, beans. If a child says this as means, what the child is doing is taking that b, b voiced bilabial stop and swapping it out for a voiced bilabial nasal stop so that it's more similar to the means all that n at the end right n, because the n that n n sound is an alveolar nasal and z z is an alveolar fricative and they're like i just don't want to mess with this bilabial thing here at the beginning i want everything to be as alveolar as possible because alveolar rocks my world right now in this word and so it becomes means, right? They like that alveolar, they're going with the nasal sound, right? They're like, okay, so I've got this, I got these alveolar things here at the end. This is very nasal, this nuh, nuh, nuh. So now I'm gonna take this buh, 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 and I'm gonna turn it into a nasal too to make it more like the nuh. I want to have as few changes as possible through this word, going from a by voiced bilabial stop to a alveolar nasal, to an alveolar fricative is too hard. So I'm going to take that bilabial stop and make it a nasal, turn it from b into m. Both are bilabial, both are stops. Just one is oral, one is nasal. So I'm going to make it more nasal so it's more like the n, so I'm making fewer changes through this word. Okay, so beans becomes means. And these are all real examples that have been gathered from actual kids. It's not just stuff I made up. Um, okay, so then there's voicing assimilation. Voicing is where they take, now, they take the voicing from vowels or, or consonants in the word, and they generalize it across the word. So they either make everything voiced or everything voiceless. Now, in English, all of our vowels are voiced. This is not true for all languages of the world. In some languages, like Japanese, uh, there are voiceless vowels. So just like you can have the difference between p and b, you can have the difference between u and a. Okay, so two different, you can have a voiceless vowel and a voice vowel, just like you can have a voiceless consonant and a voice consonant. Okay, but in American English, 
all of our vowels are voiced. So American English speaking children have a preference for making everything as voiced as possible. Because what that means is I'm going to turn on my vocal folds and just leave them running all the way through this word rather than turning them off and on and off and on and off and on. God, you guys make this so complicated growing up. Turning your vocal folds off and on. I just want to leave them on and keep them going so that people can hear me. Okay. So you take a word like kitty and it becomes giddy. So now the baby says something like, here, kitty, 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 kitty. Instead of here, kitty, 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 because that's harder to do. They have to switch their vocal folds off and on, and that's difficult. So we're just going to turn them on and keep them on. Kitty, kitty, kitty. Then we see something called consonant harmony. This is where, if they have a sound, that differs just in one place of articulation, or maybe a manner of articulation, then they will change it so that all of the consonants will have the same place and manner. So instead of saying cat, the child might say tat. And you're like, nobody ever says that. And I refer you to that American classic who says, I taught, I taught, putty tat. Right? Tweety Bird. Tweety Bird did this all the time. I taught, I taught, putty tat. All kinds of consonant harmony going on there. Because Tweety Bird loves t for some reason. I don't know what the bird thing is with the dealers. I have no idea. But... I taught I taught Tweety Tat. So, and, and in fact, Tweety Bird's speech is actually very consistent with American English children's phonological simplification. So whoever did Tweety Bird's vocabulary actually was paying attention to what children really do. Because Tweety Bird really talks like an American English speaking child, which is kind of funny. So cat. Example because that voiceless velar stop again made further back is fronted to make it consistent with the t at the end. So this is an example not only of consonant harmony where they've made all the consonants the same, but of fronting because when you got more processes that make something happen, it's more likely to happen. And then. There's an example, uh, another phenomenon, reduplication. We saw this in the children's babbling, and we see it in their speech now, uh, where they will figure out how many syllables a word has, and they will pick the stress syllable or the first syllable to feel the same, and they will just say that syllable over and over in order to get the right number of syllables to say the word. So my daughter did this one. This is not an uncommon one. And we see it a lot in children's speech. So, you know, mother becomes mama. Daddy becomes dada. Grandpa becomes papa or poppy. Right? So we see this reduplication. Um, it's, it's not uncommon, especially in children's speech, where they pick a syllable, so grandma becomes nana or mama, right? Where they pick a syllable and then they just reduplicate it for the number of syllables they need for the word. We also see deletion. Deletion of predictable things. So we know that kids don't like liquids. Luff and rough are hard. And in English, we get a lot of consonant clusters with liquids. So for example, things like glove and grape, where the l and r sound show up with another consonant to start a word. And kids are like, forget that noise. If there's already a consonant here at the beginning, I'm just going to skip the liquid. So here we have consonant cluster reduction, where they make the consonant cluster, because making lots of consonants in a row is actually pretty challenging. English does it a lot, like with you know words like screw, where we have s, k, r, 
all in a row, but there are some languages that refuse to do it at all, like Japanese. There are no consonant clusters in Japanese at all. Everything is a consonant vowel combination or a syllabic consonant. So there are no consonant clusters at all. They just don't make them at all, which is why when they translate English speaking words into Japanese, it sounds really funny. So for example, the word sexual harassment, which didn't exist in Japanese until the Clarence Thomas trials. This is when he was going to the Supreme Court, where it didn't even exist because there was no concept of sexual harassment in Japanese culture, because that was just how men treated women. What are you talking about? Don't need a word for it. That's just how it is. But sexual harassment has a lot of consonant clusters in it. In Japanese, it's sexual harassment, because they have to put a vowel after every consonant. And so they just reduced it, because that's way too hard to say, to seku hara. So if you want to talk about sexual harassment in Japanese, you just talk about seku hara. The first part of sex and the first, first part of harassment. Because, you know, we all want to simplify. Life is just too damn hard. Just like personal computer is pasoko. Because why would you want to say the whole word? You don't need to. Right? But still, constant vowel, constant vowel, constant vowel. So, say a child has to deal with an English word like glove. Why say glove? Love is overrated. I'm just going to say gov. I got one gov, two govs. Yes! <laughs> right? Because well, I don't need the glove. It's not like you're going to misunderstand me. One gov, two govs. Done. Okay? So since you understand, why should I bother making that whole extra sound that's hard? They also, I told you, like to pay attention to stressed syllables because they've learned that things that are stressed matter more. So when syllables in a word are unstressed, kids are more likely to delete them. So in a word like giraffe, giraffe, where the second syllable is stressed and the first syllable is not stressed, kids are much more likely to just delete the first syllable. And they don't say giraffe, they say raff. Because why say j? If you're not going to emphasize it, it must not be very important. So I'm just going to say raff instead of giraffe. They also do some interesting blending, just like we do as adults. They'll blend things together. Uh, they'll take words that are long and have lots of syllables and try to collapse them down into a single syllable. So a word like pacifier might get reduced to something like passy, or it can get reduced down to something like path. So again, the idea here is dumping out syllables that don't seem to matter, and because they have the leeway that comes with creating idiomorphs, they can make their own words for things. So when I was growing up, pacifier never got reduced to passy, but I know lots of people who use passy as a reduction of that word. I'd never heard that until I was an adult, and nobody ever said passy to me. It was always path when I was growing up. Path. Give me path. People say passy a lot now, but that's because pacifier, pacifier, those are the first two syllables, and they're like, okay, it's too much work to say the whole rest of the word. I'm just going to focus on the first part. Okay, so next time, we're going to talk about fall. So make sure you bring this worksheet back with you, and we'll talk about